Welcome to the Tuesday edition of the St. Mark Spark. It's good to be with you all after two weeks of being away. I took the time uh, with the family to head to Colorado uh, for one week and the rest of it was a staycation. And as we enter July, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago that uh, we're going to have the spark a couple times a week. It's going to be a little bit more sporadic as we allow a little bit of time for myself and for Pastor MP to recharge and to kind of reevaluate uh, what the spark is going to look like moving forward. So this is actually even a little bit earlier uh, than the normal one o'clock central uh, spark time together. But as we gather together, the invitation is to leave a comment to uh, participate in this discussion. And let's say a word of prayer. Lord, we give you thanks that you are here, that you're always with us. Before we wake up, you are there. Before we step out, you're in the world. And so we ask God that we would have eyes to see you, have feet to move to your call. Lord, that uh, we might recognize that you are always with us and your love will not let us go. Be with us in this time together. Amen. So I'm looking at the daily lectionary today, and I know we had been going through Matthew's gospel, but uh, the thing we're reading about right now is uh, my favorite psalm, uh, one of my favorite psalms anyway. It's Psalm 139. Now, you asked me at different points in my life, and I'll give you a different answer on what my favorite psalm is. I've always liked the 23rd psalm uh, in college, uh, Psalm 121. I discovered it uh, without recognizing it. Recognizing that so many other people love Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes, I look up to the hills from whence cometh my help. It's a, it's a beautiful psalm as well. But there's something about Psalm 139 that has just really been on my heart over the, uh, over the past uh, several weeks and several months. And so I'm going to read all of it today, and then we're going to talk a little bit about it. It's about the inescapable God. So with an open heart and soft uh, open ears and a soft heart. Let us listen now as God speaks to us through God's word. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O oh God, and the, that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me 
and lead me in the way everlasting. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, Psalm 139, I adore, I love this psalm. And frankly, to be honest with you, if, if I were editing the Bible, if I were editing the psalm, I would get rid of verses 19 through 24. It feels like such a perfect psalm up until that point. But it's almost as if the psalmist is writing, the psalmist is singing, the psalmist is praying to God in the first uh, three-fourths of this psalm. And then maybe the psalmist looks over and sees someone he does not like. See someone with whom he has an issue with. See somebody who is wicked. See somebody who has treated him poorly or, or has turned his back on God's will. And then the psalm takes a dark turn. I'm not going to focus on the last uh, five verses, but I do want to acknowledge they exist. Sometimes we get the Bible we have, not the Bible we want. And we recognize so much of our life is like that. We might be praying and might be in a, in a very prayerful spirit, or we might feel that God is certainly with us in a very real and powerful and tangible way. And then we get distracted. We see a squirrel, whatever it happens, and, and our attention is focused, taken off of God and, and less about God being with us and more about the issues we have with our neighbor. I was talking with one of our daughters this week and we were talking about something different and, and I read the psalm to her because it means so much to me. I love how the, the psalm uh, psalmist says that I try to count all the thoughts of God. They're more than the, the sand on the beach. But even if I were to count all the things that cannot be counted, cannot be comprehended, even if I do all of these things in the end, I'm still with God. In the end, God is still with me. Now, Psalm 139 has been used and oftentimes misused uh, throughout its history. And in fact, it's oftentimes misused right now, I believe, in, in certain political movements or certain social movements. Psalm 139 is oftentimes used in the, uh, the pro-life movement. But what I encourage you all, I encourage myself, is, is to think bigger than a single movement. Think bigger than a single cause of the day. Because if anything, if we want to claim to be pro-life, we have to be consistent. But to be consistent means that it's being more than just about being pro-birth. It's from the cradle to the grave. It's about valuing human life. And even what the psalmist is writing about here, it talks about uh, the mother's womb, but also talks about being formed in the earth because ultimately it is God who forms us. We're reminded of Adam, that Adam comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which means dirt or ground, and that, that we're formed from the, the dirt. And then later we're told oftentimes at funerals, if we come from dust and to dust we shall return. We hear that also on Ash Wednesday as well. But it takes uh, some time to dive back into Psalm 139. So I'm going to uh, invite you to, to hear some of this again with new ears. What Psalm 139 is saying is that God knows us wholly and completely. Now, our vision of God is only glimpses here and there. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we're looking through smudgy glass. We're looking through a mirror dimly. It's that we're getting glimpses of God's love, but it's like we're looking into an old beat up pan or aluminum foil. We get bits and pieces and it's wonderful on this side of eternity. It's wonderful to have those glimpses of love and we rest in these things. We abide in these things, but they are nothing compared to being fully and completely in God's presence. God is with us always. God knows us completely. And for us to try to know God, it is impossible. It is the finite trying to grasp the infinite. It is us in, who have a set number to our days trying to grasp and understand the eternal. So the two parts of this, the first part of this is the inescapable God. And the second part of the psalm is the incomprehensible God. Talking about the inescapable God, this is what the psalmist says, Where can I go to escape you? 
where can I go to escape your presence? And he says, I can go to heaven, but of course God is already there. And the psalmist says, I can go to Sheol, I can go to Hades, I can go to hell, however you want to translate this or understand this. I can go there and even there you were with me. In the darkness I could try to hide myself, but darkness is not dark to you, O oh God. It is like light to you. God is inescapable. Now we know this from the Bible. We hear this in the story of Jonah, that God says to Jonah, go. And Jonah goes the other direction. But just because Jonah went the other direction doesn't mean that God's hand is not still upon Jonah and that God does not have a plan for Jonah and a plan for the people of Nineveh. We hear the story of the prodigal son about the son who, who leaves his father, who says the, to the father, you're basically dead to me. But we hear in that story too, the father will welcome that son home. The father never stops yearning, never starts stops loving, never stops wanting the child to be back in that full relationship again. Even after Jesus' death and his, his resurrection, it was Jesus who appeared to the disciples. And when Jesus appeared to them after he had died, after he had been resurrected, in the midst of their fear, Jesus says to them, peace be with you. The inescapable God even comes back a week later for Thomas. And finally, in Romans chapter 8, we hear the Apostle Paul asking, what is going to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ? And at last, Paul says, I am convinced that neither life, nor death, nor heaven, nor hell, nor anything else in all of creation can take us away from the love of God. That is the strongest thing in the entire universe, in all of creation, is God's love. So the psalmist, when the psalmist is talking about the inescapable God, this is what the psalmist is saying. This is how it is echoed in the scripture, in Jonah, and the prodigal, and the disciples, and Thomas, and at last Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> but then, then it's important to say that God, we're, that God is inescapable, but also that God is incomprehensible. And the psalmist shifts and says, how weighty are your thoughts, O God? I, I try to count them. I can't. I can't count them. I, I can't understand everything that you are doing. In fact, sometimes we look out at the world and we say, where is God in the midst of all of that? Now, some pastors will say you should never question God. Some churches say you should never question the Bible, should never question what God is doing. And yet the, the scripture gives us license to do that very thing. The story of Job, the man who had everything, who lost everything. And the story of Job in this very long long story from the wisdom literature in the Hebrew scripture at the very end of it God ha has an audience with Job that Job finally gets to interact with God and and God said were you there when I did all of this when I set the foundations for the earth were you there when I created the animals were you there when I did all of these things and and even as Job has this audience with God God says you can't comprehend all of this and Job, who had so many questions for God, is moved to silence. Also for the disciples, how many times, how many times do they not get either the parables or the miracles or the even point of Jesus' ministry on this life? Sure, it was for healing. It was for wholeness. But it was also to save people from their sins. The disciples were thinking maybe a political Messiah. And, and Jesus was something completely different. So if we ever feel lost, we're in good company with the disciples of Jesus. But we trust and hope that the curtain, that curtain that was ripped at uh, the, the death of Jesus, that, that curtain that came down from the top to the bottom, that curtain will be peeled back a little bit more and a little bit more. And so that we might see glimpses more of what God's love and what God's truth is in our lives. We know we see, but in a mirror dimly. We cannot completely comprehend what God is doing. And yet we hear people trying to do that. We hear people trying to say, well, God is on my side. And, and if we, well, we're going to talk more about that in the Sunday message and the story of the crucifixion, about what it means to have God on your side, or, or more so, the better question is, is how to be on God's side. 
not having God be a rubber stamp for what we want, for the prejudices we have, for the desires that we have, but more so how to totally rearrange our lives, rearrange our perspective to strive more to be on God's side. But so many people are, are acting in, in politics and business and other places to say that, that God is on our side. The writer Anne Lamott uh, famously wrote these words, you can safely assume that you have created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates the same people that you do. You can safely assume that you have created God in your own image when God hates the people you do. Now, that's a pretty biting commentary and it's a, a pretty stark prophetic word for us today. God is always there. We cannot escape God, not, nor should we ever try. And, and we know in our own lives, we've, we've been prodigals. We know we have people we love who we feel that they have wandered too far away. But even for us and even for them, God's love is still there. And God's love is incomprehensible. But yet, even though it's incomprehensible, we should, should, we should still strive to understand it. We should still strive to grasp it. We should still strive, uh, strive to share that. At last, what, uh, what Paul writes in the church in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What Paul is saying that you might know it, but even the stuff that goes beyond knowledge, that you might know it in your spirit, in your hearts, in your life. At last, the psalmist says, How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. I come to the end. I am still with you. We give thanks today. We give thanks today that God's love was there with us in the beginning, even as we were intricately woven, even as God's fingerprints were all over us. We're thankful that God holds us and has us for all of eternity, that we come to the end. I am still with God. You are still with God, and we give thanks that God is still with us and that God is for us. May we be so filled with that love that we cannot help but share that good news with others this week. I pray God's blessing on you this day. It's good to see uh, Kathy and Judy commenting here as well. It's good to be back in the office, and uh, I pray just that you might be a blessing to others. Go in peace.